Hej, Agnes. Agnes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Very good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I request that you put that presentation that I've just sent. Yes, I've received it. Thank you. Okay. We'll Thank play you. video immediately after your presentation eh, on the referral. Sorry? After your presentation, we'll be playing a video on referral. Eh? Okay. Thanks. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Victoria. Hello. Uh, our, uh, our participants online, you're welcome. We'll be starting in the next uh, two or three minutes. We're just waiting for our panelists to join as well as be able to start at 2 p.m. sharp. Thank you. Dr. Victoria, can you hear me? Please confirm. Dr. Kajimu, you have my presentation. Hello? Yes, Victoria. Uh, yes, you will help me to, to whatever, share it. Is it okay? That's okay. Okay, thank you. Victoria, have you heard from uh, Dr. Dale? Uh, uh, about what? Not yet online. Okay, it's not yet online. Maybe they're still in the meeting. Yeah, but it's the moderator, so. Oh, Dr. Dale, oh, let me call him. So colleagues who have joined will uh, just spend a few minutes making some announcements as we wait for the moderator for this webinar to join. We'd like to welcome everyone who is joining us for this webinar. 
the first webinar in the year 2022 that is organized by a National Safe Motherhood Expert Committee, that is NASMEC. A NASMEC exists to support efforts around accelerating reductions in maternal and newborn mortality in Uganda. A lot of efforts is going around supporting districts, facilities, working with the Ministry of Health to contribute reducing maternal mortality and neonatal mortality, rationalizing health center falls, supporting um, critical card placements in facilities, and a number of efforts. But one of those efforts is to provide continuous professional involvement, opportunities for health workers across all levels of care through these uh, webinars that we host on a monthly basis. This is our first webinar this year. And unique, that is something that is unique this year is that we'll be having quite an interesting schedule. Uh, we had a lot of maternal topics discussed last year. This year, we're going to blend that with the uh, newborn on your neonatal care topics. So every after month, you have a neonatal topic and then also have a maternal topic. We'll be sharing the schedules as soon as our email account is active. We've had a bit of a challenges with our email that we've been using to share with your presentations, recordings, but that shall be sorted within a few days. So we want to welcome you again. Uh, I see Dr. Deo Monube has joined and uh, Dr. Jolie Nakunda, you're welcome. Our panelists, I would like to um, just pass a few do's and don'ts. Uh, we are going to have the panelists speak to us and present the topics for today. If you have a question, please use the two ways of uh, talking to us. One is that you, you can make a general comment in the chat in case you're not hearing us well or um, you want to make a general comment. If you want to ask a specific question to one of the panelists, please go to the Q&A tab on your screen and type your questions and the panelists will respond to that. When we come to a time of uh, hearing some feedback from the audience or asking questions in an interactive discussion, we will unmute you and allow you to speak. Other than that, we'll all remain muted for throughout the period of the webinar. I would like to welcome the neonatal team, a team uh, of experts across uh, medical and uh, nursing or neonatal nursing fields that will be taking us through this webinar this afternoon. Welcome, Dr. Deo, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you, Richard, for the introduction. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. So good afternoon to everyone again, and would welcome you to the essential care for every newborn. We have three exi exciting talks that are going to be given. The first will be by Dr. Jolly Nankunda, who will look at current data on newborn mortality and some newborn care practices in Uganda. Then it will be followed by Dr. Victoria Nachibuka, who will talk about levels of newborn care. And lastly, by Sister Agnes, who would look at the components of the essential newborn care and referral of a sick child. All these talks are very important in the sense that they give us a perspective towards newborn care. And as we are all aware, the biggest mortality that we are having in our current statistics are in the infant period, and more specifically in the neonatal period. So these talks will give us a perspective around it. Thank you all for joining. Uh, Richard has given us some housekeeping rules, so I will not repeat them. And I would kindly uh, request Dr. Jolly Nankunda to take us through the first talk. Thank you very much and welcome Dr. Nankunda. Please share your slides, Dr. Nankunda, and begin your talk. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Monube. Um, let 
Yeah, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I hope you are able to see my screen. Yes, we can. Uh, just put and it in, you are uh, able to hear me. Yes, we can. Just requesting that we put yes. it in slideshow. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So I'll just share with you some uh, uh, thoughts about uh, newborn health status uh, in Uganda. As we look at what has been happening to our newborns, in the country over uh, over the years. So by way of introduction, we know that the first day a baby is born is the most dangerous day of their life. And this is irrespective of where a baby is born, whether the rich or poor setting. Unfortunately, over 90% of newborn deaths which occur do happen in Asia and Africa. And nearly half of the births in low-income countries occur without a skilled birth attendant. And no wonder that we are having more than a majority of the newborn deaths, because we know under which attendants are most of our mothers deliver. And few mothers and babies have postnatal contact with providers who can deliver intervention that save lives. We know after the baby is born and mother is happy, usually they don't think that they need to have, for example, awareness check to see how someone, how the baby and the mother are actually doing. So globally, a lot has been happening. And over the last two decades, there has been substantial progress in reducing mortality in children under five. And yet newborn mortality has declined at a much slower pace than most uh, than that of post neonatal uh, uh, children, 42% versus 65% globally. And the risk of child death is highest in the first month of life. So the neonatal uh, life remains the most dangerous period of anyone's life. And the proportion of newborn deaths among all under five deaths is now at 47% which is up from 40% in 1990. And you may wonder what's happening, but probably this is because a lot has been uh, going on around newborn notification and identification of all deaths. Whereas previously many deaths were passing and recorded unnoticed. And newborn deaths have decreased from 5 million in 1990 to 2.5 million in 2018. And this is mainly because of the interventions which have been happening in recent years, focusing on the newborn. There's another monster, which many times we don't look at, the issue of stillbirths. Around 2 million stillbirths happen. You know, and these are babies who are born with no sign of life at 28, eight, uh, at 28 weeks of pregnancy or later. That is where we have had our viability for these uh, pregnancies fixed. And this was what occurred worldwide in 2019. And what is unsettling is that many of these might have been prevented with proper care. The global stillbirth rate in 2018 was about 14 per, uh, uh, 14 per 1,000 total births. And we know that this is still a high number of babies to be born uh, uh, still birth. These babies who never see you know, the light of day. And again, we know this may be an underestimate since many of these still births often go unreported. And you may ask, but why are newborns dying? And this has not changed over the years, it has remained more or less you know, the three common monsters that have been killing our newborns. Complications of prematurity, then asphyxia, you know, that is why you have complications during childbirth, and then neonatal infection, which account for about 80% of newborn uh, deaths. And we know that complications which occur during childbirth and from preterm birth together account for one fourth of all the under five child deaths. 
And this is why the neonatal mortality is still contributing a big bulk of the death uh, in the under five uh, uh, children. Of course, this is just a, a, a glance to show where most uh, babies are dying. And now when we come back home, Uganda status, you know, neonatal mortality rates are 20 deaths per 1,000 live, uh, live births reported in 19, 20 statistics. And then neonatal mortality rate you know, has been falling from 53 deaths per 1,000 live, uh, live births in 1970 to 20 in 2019. But we know that we need it to fall even further so that we can be able to save many more. And this gives us an annual reduction in newborn mortality of about 2.7%, still birth rate of 21%, skilled birth attendance of 74%, and this is a big improvement, and hopefully it will start having an impact. And then we know that also preterm birth rate, uh, those who are born below 37 weeks, remains at around seven per 100 live births. And proportion of under five child deaths that are newborn remains at a 14, 44%. So you see newborns are still contributing a lot, still a lot to our childhood uh, mortality. Now in, in uh, 2005, uh, following the Lancet Neonatal Series, that's when Uganda held the first national stakeholder meeting on newborn survival following which a situation analysis on newborn health in the country was done. And the findings, you know, were interesting that at least 45,000 newborn deaths were occurring each year, which accounts for about four out of 10 deaths before one year of age. And it was also found that an equal number of babies are born dead or are still born. And it was also reported that over half of the total newborn deaths occur during the first week of life, and mainly during the first 24 uh, hours. And again, the most common causes of neonatal deaths at that time were similar to the rest of Africa, and these included birth asphyxia, infections, and complications of preterm birth. And we know that many of these deaths could be prevented with healthy home behaviors, and also better access to quality health care. Tracking newborn health uh, is better. Yeah. Tracking newborn health better is, is helps to improve uh, services. And we also know that there are a number of policies in place from that situation analysis, but we needed to focus more on intervention, which could actually turn around uh, the gloomy statistics. There's the very many policy level strategies and we've all been seeing these, just a few of them. And mm -hmm. many of us have participated probably in a few of these. Some of these are being renewed because they have uh, run out of time. There has been so many, a number of strategic approaches, you know, to focus and improve uh, newborn health and survival, MDGs, SDGs currently, the UN commodities for newborn survival. And you know, all these, we've been going through them. And this is why probably we've been seeing the improvement that we are seeing at the moment. But we are not yet uh, there and we need uh, to do more so that we can save more uh, newborns. These are also the many interventions. I know when it comes to birth asphyxia, many of us have uh, been trained and have participated in helping babies breathe first, you know, so that we can be able to minimize, you know, the risk of bad outcomes uh, when babies uh, suffer uh, uh, complications at birth. Kangaroo mother care implementation, which we know is on the rollout in the country, so that, you know, we can be able to uh, help our small preterm babies not only survive, but also be able uh, to thrive. And from that situation analysis, there was one policy change, you know, of uh, reviewing babies in the first week. 
rather than previously where on discharge, the mother and baby would be asked to come back after six weeks. Because now we realize that by six weeks, most of those who have died will have died anyway. So we needed to see them earlier in order to make uh, an impact. And I know human resources for newborn care, this is a, a very big thing, this is important, and we need to make sure that you know, people who are handling newborn have skills to be able to do the right thing uh, for these, uh, these babies. And tracking newborn indicators. You know where newborn deaths are kept uh, swept under the carpet and nothing is reported? It means that we may not even be sure of what is happening. But when these indicators are tracked and then brought to the fore, then it helps all of us in all our, uh, at all our different levels to be able to uh, take action and be able to, uh, to act. And I want to say that uh, when creation of neonatal corners and NICUs. You know, I know there's a rollout of uh, uh, NICUs and neonatal special care units, neonatal corners in many of the uh, hospitals in the country. And I think this will go a long way because we know that when a baby is born in one unit and they are preterm or they are not well and they have to be transported to another unit, during transportation a lot happens. And many of the outcomes are usually not good, mainly because of what may have happened during uh, transportation. So we need to deliver solutions that work and there are solutions which have been shown to work, you know, at the different uh, time during the continuum of, prayer, of care, during the pre-pregnancy period, the pregnancy period, those ones targeting another time of birth and then after, uh, after birth. And we are seeing that skilled attendance, skilled birth attendance during childbirth is important, you know, because then the baby will be having access to uh, what can help them survive. And we know that two, over two thirds of newborn deaths could be prevented through high coverage of cost effective, low tech, maternal, and newborn health interventions. So we may not start thinking of high tech. We need to first uh, make sure we have mastered and we have maximized use of the low tech and the uh, uh, interventions which are very cost effective. And we know that evidence-based strategies to save the lives of women and babies include many interventions which are usually provided through integrated service delivery packages at different levels in the continuum uh, of care. So how can we continue to improve quality of newborn care? We need to have protected spaces for newborns, you know, facilities that are providing the emergency obstetric care. Where we know a baby is going to be born, we know they may get into trouble and we need to have a corner which is uh, well prepared uh, to receive them. Who is going to look at these babies, you know, when they have trouble? We need human resources for newborn care. We need them to be skilled, but we also need them to be in sufficient numbers if they are able to do the needful for these babies. Therefore, skills training for all cadres looking after newborn is key. And here I'm very happy to say that uh, since in Uganda we have started an in house neonatal fellowship training, which is uh, taking on both pediatricians and nurses. I think this is a, a step in the right direction, and hopefully this is going to uh, be able to help to strengthen all the NICUs that are being set up in the different uh, hospitals. We need to document, need to get the numbers in order to understand the burden because we cannot start planning for a monster we do not know the size of. We need to keep track of each newborn's journey because every newborn life matters. And in case we have a problem and we can't save a baby and we lose them, we need to tie their deaths in a timely uh, manner. And therefore, this is where MPDSR becomes uh, important. When we do it, when we uh, review, we need to use the findings to bridge gaps and improve care, not just to do it for the sake of sitting and having a discussion, but we need to make sure that 
whatever resolutions, whatever uh, recommendations you make that are being put in place. And we keep reviewing the cycle to make sure that we are making uh, an impact. And then innovations. We know that many implementing partners have come up with innovations which have been shown to work. And I want to share an example you know, of, uh, um, of a, a, a team who are working in Karisus and Rakai districts. You know where they are trying to improve transportation of uh, uh, baby of mothers and their babies, you know, to make sure they bridge that gap of the delay of getting into a health facility. And I think these innovations where they have used the available resources in the community, where they have involved the people in the community, the border, border riders, the policemen, the community leaders, so that all are working together to make sure that uh, this mother and their baby actually access uh, care in a timely manner. And this has already been shown uh, to, uh, to make a difference. We need partnerships because we cannot go it all alone and make much impact. We need partnerships and collaborations. And here is where I want to share the Bale newborn unit story. I know Dr. Kathy, you know, has done a lot uh, as a person on the ground in, in the NICU in Bale. But you know, these are very, very important where you are able to, uh, to make sure that you save more uh, babies. And I usually want to, uh, I want to share this uh, uh, graph you know, from, from Bali with the Cassie's permission, the impact of change. And you know, they were not using any out of the blue uh, measures. You know where they are comparing, they were documenting and comparing their total admissions with their total deaths. And you know, when you see in October uh, 2014, you see the deaths were really high. And then when they started, uh, putting these interventions, uh, they started seeing in 2015, they started seeing you know, a drop in these uh, deaths in spite of the increasing uh, total admissions in their neonatal uh, units. And what did it take Mbale to improve, to achieve an improvement in newborn care? They instituted level one neonatal care, and here they used minimal funding. They did invested in staff training, changes in practice, maternal empowerment, so that even the mothers know, you know what to do and what is expected of them. And you know to follow up clinic so that these babies, you know, after discharge, you don't say bye bye and that's the end of it, but you keep following them and checking on them in that clinic. And then a neonatal champion. We know that for most things to succeed, we need a champion, someone who is going to be focused and keep track of what is going on and make sure they are actually uh, uh, pushing everybody to make sure the right thing is being done. Then they also institute, instituted level two care. Uh, these ones will be discussed in the next presentation. And uh, here they put some key additional investments for care. These were a dedicated neonatal ward. So that's why all obstetric units, you know, which deliver babies, they need a dedicated area for caring for neonates who are not well. A stable and reliable power source, a dependable water supply, and this is key if we are to talk of infection control, hand washing, to keeping the place clean, hand washing facilities, strict infection control policies, and dedicated nursing uh, staff. Then in order to continue improving newborn care, we need advocacy for newborn care. We need to continue creating awareness about what is needed to improve newborn health. And you may say probably I'm not part of it, but all of us need to create awareness. We are the most you know, compromised population in our country, it's the newborn, because they are the most at the highest risk of dying in their first uh, 24 hours of life. And we need to know what to advocate for. So even as you create awareness, you need to know what is on the ground. You need to know what is needed. Hence the skilling bit. We need protected human resources for newborn care. You know, this business of training people in, in a newborn care, and then within eight months, they are moved now to an outpatient setting. 
you know, really undermine the continuity of care in the, for the newborn. And we need to focus on surviving and thriving for all newborns. It's not enough, enough for the newborns to thrive, survive, but we want them to thrive so that they are able to achieve their full potential, even as adults. And that's why it is very important to have follow-up clinics for these newborns. Check on them regularly to make sure that they are doing fine. And then we need commodities for newborn care. And they should be available wherever they are needed. And they should be appropriate. This business of uh, finding you know, a cannula of gauge, uh, gauge 19 on a newborn unit is not going to help. Where you find NG tubes which are too big, masks which cannot fit the baby's face, you know, are not going to help. So we need people to understand what commodities do we need for newborn care and what, how appropriate are they and we make sure they are available when needed. And then also safety for newborn in order to thrive. So when we say we need oxygen for newborn, we know that any excess of anything will have problems. How do we administer this oxygen to make sure it is safe for the newborn? We don't want this newborn to survive from our oxygen but they also end up with uh, blindness because that will be now another disability. So we want to make sure that all these issues are all uh, uh, addressed uh, together. So in conclusion, I want to emphasize that every one of us have, has a role to play in improving newborn health. And we need to harness all the available resources to cause improvements and be open to change in order to cause improvement. We cannot be rigid. We cannot say this is how we've always done it. We have to be open to change and say, what is evidence that is coming on board that we can look at and be able to uh, improve even what we are doing now? And let's, let us form partnerships in order to help us improve. Because if we go alone, we may move uh, probably quickly, but I'm sure we'll be able to reach far if we are uh, in partnerships and moving together. I thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Nankunda, for your presentation. There's one quick question to you. Can you explain what BAMA means in Kalisizo? What does BAMA mean such that the audience may know? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a program in, in Rakai uh, for mothers and babies. Babies and mothers ambassadors. So there, these are women in the community who help uh, to identify women in the community and they work with the project. The project identifies them and they, the project has been called BAMA. It's just an acronym. Thank you very much. And then the last thing is uh, with regard to the neonatal fellowship. Someone wanted some more details about it. I don't know if you can share quickly as we move to um, the next presenter. Mm, the, the neonatal fellowship, uh, we, we started uh, the two years back and uh, it takes on uh, pediatricians people, uh, pediatricians who have finished their MA training in pediatrics and want to specialize in the neonatology. And also we, we realized that pediatricians are not going to work alone in the newborn unit. So we needed uh, them to have nurses also who are training. So there's also, uh, the, it takes on also the nurses. So these are, it's a fellowship, you know, which is taking on two different cadres, but each with their own uh, curriculum, according to what will be required of them. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nankunda. I would now like to welcome Dr. Victoria Nachibuka, who will actually be taking on from where you ended with regards to the levels of care. Dr. Nachibuka, you're welcome. Please kindly. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dewa. I will humbly request, uh, I humbly request our, the one who organized to help me flash my, my, 
my, my slides. I don't know if he's still on. Richard, I hope you Richard, have the request. Are you still on? I sent him my presentation. Okay. Um, okay, so next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, basically, we are here to advocate for newborn care. And as we all know that uh, to achieve the SDG target, to end the preventable newborn deaths, so that they can reach to 12 deaths per 1,000 live births by 2030, it's important for us to expand and transform the provision of care for all the newborns. Next slide, please. So globally, every year, we have 140 million babies that are born per year. Of these, about 110 million babies need basic care. That means that they need obstetric care, essential newborn care, warmth, breastfeeding, hygiene, and infection control. However, about 30 million small and sick newborn babies have less threatening conditions. Therefore, they need special care units, and that is what we call level two in terms of caring for the newborns. But even still further, about eight to 10 million babies are going to need intensive newborn care, and probably they will need respiratory support, and that is the CPAP, that is what we call the tertiary care. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Richard, okay. So when we, this was just representing in the, in the whole world, we have about 140, 140 million newborn babies born. Above 110 million, about 110 million newborn babies, are only those are going to need essential newborn care. But then about 20 million newborns are going to need special care units. And about eight to 10 million newborn babies are going to need intensive care uh, units. Meaning that if we don't care for the 20 or 30 million or the 10 million, those are the babies that are going to die. That is the 2.5 million neonatal deaths that occur globally, annually. Next slide, please. So this slide just shows us for the different conditions that cause the major morbidity in the newborn period, how many of these are going to need special care units? When you look at prematurity, about 15 million preterm babies are born in a year, but about 2.3 of this million of these preterms are going to need actually respiratory support, such as CPAP. If we don't provide it, then the babies are going to die. Then for those that have severe infection or meningitis or pneumonia, we have about 6.9 that are born. About half of these are going to need special care units or intensive care units. And those that have HIE, they're about 7 to 14 million that basically need basic resuscitation. This can be done in any place, but about 1.2 million of these that have uh, significant intrapartum injury, they are going to need uh, intensive care, uh, intensive care unit care. And then those about jaundice, many of these babies that are jaundice are going to need phototherapy and exchange blood transfusion. And then about 1.3 million that have congenital abnormalities are going to require uh, surgery and intensive care in the newborn period. Let's go to the next slide, please. So how do we organize the, the care for services of the small and the sick newborn? Small and sick newborn babies require highly and high quality inpatient care. It is uh, delivered across three levels. You have the basic care, the secondary, secondary and tertiary. And according to a study in Lancet in there, 2014, when there was a, a survey done, if, 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 you, we, if we rolled out or scaled up these levels of care, up to 70% of the new don, newborn deaths due to premature complication would be averted if we only rolled out the secondary level care. And then 90% if there was intensive care 
intensive care unit that, that has been rolled out. But however, in Africa and Asia, only three quarters of our babies are not able to access this kind of care. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, organization of care for the newborn is basically three levels. You have the primary level, which is the essential newborn care. You have the secondary level, which is the special care unit. And then you have the tertiary level, which is the intensive care. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, this is a little bit busy, but what we mean by essential newborn care, Dr. Nankud had already explained. Basically, you need a place where you can take care of the babies. So that means you need a research station for stabilization and care. And then you should be able to do postnatal care for the mother and the baby. You must have infrastructure for hand washing and an outpatient facility for doing postnatal care. And then too, you need at least midwives and some nurses that can offer this care. And the technologies you basically need are basically like bag and mask, you need a radiant warmer, you should be able to give vitamin K and, um, uh, okay, sorry, you should be able to give vitamin K, you should be able to give some eye ointment, you should have a weighing machine, and you should have antibiotics, oxygen, and probably some bit of pyrosoxymetry. Uh, the other things that you need is basically you need water, okay? Um, you need water and some bit of uh, hygiene. You need also to find a way of having infection control, communication, and a functional referral system. And you need to have an, a newborn, a newborn, a newborn record and a facility register and a well-written policy of how mothers and babies should be. So the interventions that you need are basically uh, you're going to have skin to skin, breastfeeding, cold care. You must be able to research tech babies, that is our HPP. You should have early initiation and support for, for breastfeeding. And then you also should be able to do routine care like vitamin K. You should be able to, to administer like a nivirapine in prevention of mother to child transmission. And you should be able to assess the baby for any danger signs and give pre treatment before the baby is referred. Next slide, please. So in secondary level care, and that is where that is our special care unit. So this is our secondary level. So this is a this is where you have a dedicated space where you have areas for research station, stabilization of the baby. You have a, a designated area uh, for kangaroo mother care. Uh, you have enough uh, electricity infrastructure. You also have some nurses and doctors who are going to do rounds and who should be on call take care of the babies. So the technologies that you need here, you basically need oxygen. Uh, you need to have uh, like a provision of how you're going to give IV fluids. You should have feeding equipment like a nasogastric tube, a spoon, uh, a cup. You should be able to make basic diagnostics, probably like you need to have a glucometer. You should at least be able to do your HB. You should have some medicines like antibiotics, aminophilin, and you should have warmers. You should have effective phototherapy and continuous sip up. And then you need other, um, you need other things like the support system. Uh, for example, you may need, uh, mothers should have somewhere they can sleep because their babies are admitted. And you also need to have clinical charts and records where these babies, when they see them, where they're written. So the interventions that you need, you need to ensure that you keep the baby warm through kangaroo mother care. Uh, you should be able to feed, assist, uh, uh, assisted feeding. That is, you should be able to pass an energy tube, safe administration of oxygen. You should be able to treat and prevent apnea or prematurity. You should be able to manage neonatal infections should be able to manage hypoglycemia, manage jaundice. You should be able to, to offer blood transfusion uh, and um, seizure management and intravenous fluids. And then also knowing which babies cannot be there. Like if you have babies with birth defects, they should be able to be referred to a higher, higher level. You should have also continuous CPAP. 
ideally, actually, at this level, at a special care unit, and you should be able to manage babies that have necrotizing enteral colitis. Next slide, please. Uh, for the tertiary care, that is like what our national referral hospital has, like Kawempe and the Mulago specialized. So here you have a designated intensive care ward. You must have enough electricity and there must be space where the mothers actually can stay close to their babies. Uh, the people that you need or the, the competences, you have nurses um, that are specialized, ideally working in this unit. You also have neonatologists on call and you may have other specialties like uh, pediatricians and you should be able to have uh, interdisciplinary uh, like communication or consultancies like you may need and you may have an anesthesia team, surgery, radiology, cardiology, neurology, ophthalmology, and, and other people like speech therapists, occupational therapists should be available. The technologies that you need, basically you in, at this place, that's where I'm going to have a ventilator. You should be able to have monitoring equipment that is monitor. You should be able to uh, administer surfactants and then parental nutrition and any specialist equipment should be at this level. And we should have uh, 24 hour advanced sub, uh, laboratory support, including diagnostics and medical imaging. And they must be like an ambulance, which is ready to, for transport from the lower, lower health units. And the other things that you may also have, basically in the interventions, basically on top of the others you have, you should be able to do total parental nutrition, mechanical ventilation, screening and treatment for retinopathy of prematurity, surfactant administration, that is at the tertiary level. And then you should also have investigations and management of birth defects, pediatric surgery, and you ideally should have also genetic services. Next slide, please. So uh, we basically, when we look at this, the importance is for us to understand how to organize newborn care. What are the levels of treatment of small and sick newborns? So we've seen the primary level, the secondary level, and the tertiary level. So this is this 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 graph is just showing us what some countries like the UK or the US went through to reach a neonatal mortality of twelve. So when you see in phase one, they basically had public health approaches. They basically had, there were no basic like neonatal units. They would just talk about exclusive breastfeeding, hygiene, uh, just make sure that the mother delivers well. And you can see that their neonatal mortality was in the forties. So in, 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 in phase two, they introduced the, the they introduced uh, they introduced the, the like level two where they started improving care during pregnancy and the time of birth. And you can see that their mortality reduced to about 26 to 27, and that is where we are. But in first three, when they had like intensive care and special care units, you realize that their mortality fell to 12. And in, in order for us, for our mortality to reach 12, we must improve and transform the way we care for newborns in our settings. Next slide, please. So this is just showing the different phases that the UK and US went through to reduce their mortality to 12 uh, deaths per 1,000 uh, total births. Next slide, please. Next slide. So when you look globally, most of the countries where there has been significant reduction in the neonatal mortality, if you look at China, these um uh these are these these are the these are the other are other are are countries what which have put a lot of emphasis on having special care units or what we call level two care and that is what we are advocating for that at least in every district hospital you have a special care unit with that kind of staff and skill and those interventions provided so all these countries the units that had Neonatal units level two have the fastest reduction in the neonatal mortality. And that is what we are advocating for here. Next slide, please. So, so 
all the example countries where you have reduction of, of neonatal mortality, that is in Africa, that's Rwanda and Malawi, have improved one, the obstetric care and special newborn care. And they have invested in, in scaling up intensive care units, especially ventilatory support. That is use of CPAP. No country has reduced their neonatal mortality less than 15 deaths per 1,000 total births without an increased population level coverage of intensive care, especially CPAP. For, I think for me, that is very important. CPAP should be the standard of care for any baby that has respiratory distress in, in Uganda. And we are really trying to see that this reaches, everybody knows about CPAP and its use so as to reduce your natural mortality. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So special, special and intensive care would have neonatal deaths in hospitals and respiratory care support for preterm is essential to get our SDG target of 12 deaths per 1,000 life births. So that's very, very important if we are to, to reduce, to reach the target of, of, of 12 deaths per 1,000, we have to invest in special care units. We have to improve respiratory support, to especially the preterm, because most of our preterm babies who are born are between 32 to 37 weeks. Many of them will need, not need a lot of surfactant, but if we improve their respiratory support, would improve their survival. Next slide, please. So, we are going to talk about a few studies that have had, had impacts where they implemented the different levels of care. What was the impact on the neonatal mortality in Uganda? Next slide, please. So this was at in Zambia. We looked, we implemented secondary level and tertiary level. Secondary level interventions were implemented from 2007, 2014, and we compared the mortality when we started implementing the tertiary level, that's 2015, 2018. As you can see, the case fatality for prematurity reduced from 16.2 when we are doing that secondary level to 20 to 9.2. However, for sepsis, we have it increased from 3% to 6.8. And then for the other causes of uh, neonatal death, the case fatality reduced from 5.6 to 2.4, and the total mortality reduced from 8.2 to 5.7. So you can see when you implement these different interventions, they have significant impact on the mortality. They're able to reduce the mortality. Next slide, please. So this is also just showing us the, the preterms, the case fatality between that when you have secondary level care and then tertiary level care. So you can see before starting the intervention, the case fatality rate for the preterm was 23.7, and then it reduced to 16.3. And then from there, when we started the tertiary, um, the tertiary interventions reduced from 11.4 to 7.8, meaning that there is a significant reduction in mortality when we implement these different levels of care in newborn. It's important that we understand them and we can know how to impl implement them in the different regions or the levels of care for the hospitals where we are. Next slide, please. So this was Dr. And Jolly already talked about it in Imbale. They started with level one, you realize the mortality started reducing and then level two. So you can see here when you look at the number of babies that were dying, when they had level one care around on a monthly basis, about 50 babies were dying. But when they implemented level two care, less than 50 babies actually were dying. So meaning there's a lot of impact when you have the different levels of care implemented uh, in, in our facilities. Next slide, please. So this is the same thing from Ballet. The neonatal mortality rate was 48% of the babies were dying without an intervention. When they put level one, it reduced from 48% to 40. And then when they implemented level two intervention, it reduced to 20%. So that is a reduction of more than almost 50%. Next slide, please. So care for the newborns is delivered across the three levels of care. 
and around 30 million sick newborn babies need to access special care units. So we need to prioritize and scale up special care units in Uganda, and also to make sure that we improve respiratory support, especially to the preterm babies. Thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Victoria, for a wonderful presentation. Some quick questions for you. Uh, one, one of the members attending asked uh, the criteria for grading NICUs. Do we have one? And how do we place the care of the newborn at home? What is the level called? Over to, to you. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, Ministry of Health is in the process of uh, actually, uh, is in the process of having the standards for newborn care. And I think these, once these standards are being drafted, they're going to be shared uh, in the, to the different health uh, facilities. Uh, when we look at new, newborns cared for at home, I would suggest probably those would need basic care because uh, those ones would basically need like breastfeeding, uh, eye care and cord care. So, that is basically maybe it should be basic, but we encourage every every newborn baby to be delivered in a hospital and to be taken care of in a health facility. So you wouldn't want babies to be delivered at home because just in case that baby develops a problem uh, uh, and, and 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 we have not really cared, the baby has not been cared for by a health worker that is going to really, it's going to be really not be very good. So we encourage most of the babies to be delivered in a health facility. Thank you. Last two questions. Um, one, is surfactant available at regional referral hospitals? And then lastly, people who practice what someone has written, the improvised CPAP, which is used in many centers, does it have an effect on mortality? Do you have a comment on that? Over. Okay, thank you very much for your, for your, for your questions. Uh, yes, surfactant is available in the tertiary institutions. I think Dr. Nankunda can help to answer that. She may have more information. And, and, and what, we are, we are, we are, what we are suggesting, as, as, as you've said, as we have seen that what is important in the levels of care is actually surfactant is at the end, okay? So you can see there are many other interventions actually you can have in place and these babies actually the mortality can reduce. So usually surfactant is tertiary level. We are advocating for it now in the national referral hospitals. And I think once you have people who are skilled and they know what to do, it can come down to the regional referral hospitals. Probably we should, First, maybe have special care units that are well equipped in our regional referral uh, and district hospitals that are at level two. If we can have that, you already saw from Dr. From the, from Dr. Catherine's study that even the mortality reduced by half. So those are things that we, are, we, 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 we need to know that it's available, but at the national referral, uh, I think that's what I have to say. Concerning CPAPs, uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, surfactant is available actually even in Kawe, but it's national referral, which is, which is very important. And then the, uh, in terms of CPAPs, yes, they, the, the improvised CPAPs, yes, they may have an effect per se, but they are not as good as the, the, the appropriate CPAPs. So I know we all don't have them, but that's why we are, we are presenting to everybody that is listening, we are presenting to the implementing partners. I believe some people, Ministry of Health are here to see that we have appropriate CPAPs to all our district hospitals, to all our regional referral hospitals, to all our, our national referral hospitals. So we can still use them. They may have an effect, but it may not be as good as the appropriate CPAP. So that's why we are presenting this so that people can know what they need at the different levels and they're able to implement what is appropriate for their level of care. Thank you.
Um, thank you very much, Dr. Yes. Victoria, for answering the questions. We will now move on to our second last presentation. Um, I'd like to invite Sister Agnes to please um, unmute and share her slides. And when Sister Agnes is done with her presentation, we'll have a brief presentation by Brenda Carono from the USAID MCHN program. Thank you. Sister Agnes, are you on? Yes, Yes, great. I'm on. Please go ahead, you're welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for participating. Thank you the previous presenters for opening my presentation. And I will just highlight, as already mentioned, I'm Sister Agnes, working at Mulago Specialized Hospital as a senior midwife and a neonatal care nurse. Thank you so much. Next slide. So the presentation outline is looking at what is essential newborn care, what are the components, when to refer a sick baby, how to safely refer, and what is our role. Small and sick newborns require timely quality care to survive, as already said, and this includes provision of warmth, feeding support, safe oxygen therapy, and effective phototherapy, then prevention and treatment of infections. What are the components of essential newborn care? So, first of all, essential newborn care this is the care given to all newborn babies in the first 90 minutes after birth so that they can survive and thrive. And it's an emphasis that they could survive and are not able to thrive. Thrive is to grow well and do everything in time and have their life reach their potential. So in the first one hour, following initial care, at birth, we should continue skin to skin contact as you monitor them, as you monitor this baby for breathing. And this is done by some of the midwives, but what happens, some people immediately the baby is born, they tend to wrap the baby and put the baby aside. We are emphasizing that in the first one hour, let the baby keep with the mother skin to skin. It helps in monitoring breathing, baby will feed well and will keep warm. Since most of the mothers, don't have what to use. Then there's need to initiate breastfeeding with emphasis on supporting the mother to properly position and attach the baby on the breast. Most of the time, we should ensure that we support these mothers to position these babies well and attach. She could be resting in bed, but please ensure that you support her to breastfeed. The earlier she initiates breastfeeding, the more successful. The late she does it, the more unsuccessful milk will not come. Since you know that breastfeeding is about the brain, initiating the hormones to eject the milk. Next slide. Next slide. Then the next 30 minutes, the other one was one hour. We need to prevent disease. So as healthcare workers, we should ensure that every baby that is born in order to survive, we should do eye care. And this eye care is provided by applying tetracycline eye ointment on the eye, in the lower eyelid, and it should be in the lower eyelid, not on top of the eyes, as most of us do. This is for protecting from eye infection and later blindness. We shouldn't forget, and we are emphasizing to prevent infection, one tube to one baby. Then about cord care. Cord, care, cord care has a lot of contradictions, but we are saying the cord should be cared for. First of all, as the baby is being born and we are going to clamp and cut the cord, we should tie it so well so that the baby is, is prevented from bleeding from the cord. Then emphasis to the parents, they should avoid applying anything on the cord. They should keep it clean 
they should keep it dry. And when they are like putting the baby in a diaper, it should be below the cord so that we prevent the cord from stinking and it should be aerated so that it dries and heals and falls off. And Minister of Health had rolled out chlorhexidine gel, but it has not reached most of the facilities. So we are emphasizing that keep the cord clean, dry. You could use plain cool boiled water, clean the cord, show these mothers how to clean. She can use made cotton swabs. She can use a clean piece of cloth. All these can help to keep the cord clean. And emphasis here to all of us, the healthcare workers, please show the mothers how to clean, to properly clean the cord to prevent cord infection. Then we should also administer vitamin K to all the babies, whether preterm or full terms. This should be a must. All babies should receive vitamin K to prevent any bleeding tendencies. We can't select which babies will bleed. So we ensure that each baby is given vitamin K on the upper outer aspect of the thigh. For the small babies, we shall give 0 0.5 milligram. And for the full-term babies, we shall give the one milligram. And that ampule normally comes as 10 milligram per one mil, the one for mixing. So we shall add nine mils of water for injection. Then we shall, that is equivalent to one mil, one milligram. And that's what we shall administer. And after reconstitution in 24 hours, it expires. So we have to label and discard and mix another one. Next slide. So, in the next 30 minutes, we need to examine the baby like you see in the pictures here. The healthcare worker is trying to examine this baby to rule out any challenges. Is this baby normal from head to toe? This should be a must so that we rule out any dangers from this baby. Next. Next slide. There. So this assessment of the baby, as I've said, examine the baby from head to toe, but emphasis is on the following. How is the baby breathing? Is the breathing okay? Is it noisy breathing? So ensure the baby is breathing quietly with a regular rhythm, abdomen moving with the chest. Count the respiratory rate for a full minute so that you know the normal rate, which is about 40 to 60 breaths per minute. The skin color should be pink. Baby should have a good muscle tone and the baby should be able to breastfeed and also ensure that the cord is well ligatured, it's well tied to, uh, to prevent bleeding. Next. Then we should also measure the baby's temperature, very important. And when you take this temperature, you have to interpret the readings, like you see. And we are emphasizing that if possible, let's provide digital thermometers that can give us accurate readings. And when we take the axillary temperature, we shall identify the baby that require special care. Next. Like as we take temperature, the normal axillary temperature is about 36.5 to 37.5 degrees centigrade. Then the temperature that we categorize that has a problem and we need to intervene by improving thermal care is about 35.5 to 36.49 degrees centigrade. Then we have a temperature that we categorize as a temperature with a danger sign, temperature that is less than 35.5 degrees or greater than 37.5, that temperature is categorized as a temperature with a danger sign, then we shall intervene. Next slide. Then weighing the baby, should, we should have a functional weighing scale, preferably a digital one, where you don't need to struggle to balance the scale. Then as you're going to weigh the baby, please clean it up 
and disinfect to prevent cross infection, to prevent infection to this newborn baby, since we are fighting for this baby to, to survive and thrive, place it on a firm flat surface. So if it's a table, please put it, it should be firm, not bouncing so that we have accurate measurements. You could put a piece of cloth, switch on and take that scale to zero, place the baby, then note the weight and document the weight in the chart of the baby. As you see in this pictorial, you ensure that the scale has gone to zero so that when you're taking the weight, you get the accurate weight. And this will help to identify that those babies that need special attention, like the low birth weight, less than 2.5 or above four kilogram that will need special attention. Next. So these were the weight categories, like 2.5 to four kilograms. That is a normal birth weight. And this baby will just be maintained to be fed and kept with the mother. But when we come to these following weights, like 1.5 to 2.49, low birth weight, one kilo to 1.49, very low birth weight, and uh, less than one kilogram, extremely low birth weight. Such category of babies will need special attention. We'll need you to examine more. Are they able to keep temperature? Are they able to feed well? Then you protect them from infection, teach the caretakers how to take care of these ones, especially to maintain their warmth, to feed and get enough and to be able to grow. So they will need special care. You don't discharge there and then. That is the weight from 1.5 and below, like from 2.4 and below. Next slide. And the classification. So from the breathing, breastfeeding, the weight, the temperature and examination, we shall be able to examine in two, three categories of babies. This is a normal baby, the first one on the left. Then a baby with a low birth weight that will need special attention, like continuous skin to skin. Then you see this other last baby on our right, needs special attention. The baby with the danger sign, you see how the baby is seeming. So you determine further care according to how the baby is. Next. So for normal baby, we ensure that we maintain a normal baby temperature by keeping this baby warm. And when we are keeping this baby's temperature warm, please ensure that you teach the caretakers not to overcover the babies so that we end up with accidents of suffocation, overwarming. They should just cover enough. So show them how to swaddle these babies. Then we support them with breastfeeding. This includes when to feed, how often to feed, mother's dirty, mother resting, position and attachment, and she should be able to breastfeed exclusively. Then sensitize the mother on breastfeeding problems and what she can do. There are different problems that she should be able to know. Like if she gets engagement, what can she do? She should express and feed the bed more often. If she gets breast sores, show how to position and attach. If she gets Best abscess, she should come back to hospital. If she has flat nipples, help her to straighten them by showing her what to do. Then don't forget to immunize the babies, BCG polio. Then before you discharge this normal baby, reassess to rule out any danger sign and ensure that the baby is able to maintain temperature, breastfeed, mother is capable before you discharge. Next. Next slide. Still the normal baby, you give guidance to the parents and caretakers for home care. Explain what is on the discharge form. Don't just give it to them. The importance of the discharge form, what information is there, is there any medication to be bought? When should they come back to hospital? So please ensure that they are able to interpret what is written on the discharge form rather than just reading it to them. Then emphasize about birth registration and offer a discharge form to the caretaker, ensuring that she will keep it safe. Then remind them about the reviews, the immunization, the six weeks review, and the rest of the things so that they can be able to 
keep in contact and come back for review. That's about the normal baby and with discharge. This is a picture just summarizing what I've just said above. Like you see, the first one is showing that you maintain a temperature by wrapping the baby well, support breastfeeding by positioning and attachment, tell the mother about breastfeeding problems like the engorgement, the sores, the abscess, so that she can be able to be helped in case she gets challenges. Then also, you begin immunization. So we are talking about polio, BCG. They shouldn't miss, they shouldn't leave the hospital. Then we also reassess these babies before we send the mothers home and give them guidance on how to care for the baby at home. That is emphasis on hygiene, avoiding the herbals that are put on the cord, those herbals that are used for bathing babies and giving baby to take, things of preventing colic, giving them things to drink. So you reassess and then give guidance for home care. Next. Then that baby that has a problem, that is a baby with an abnormal temperature, like 36.5 to 36.49 degrees centigrade. What is the solution to, imp to this? We should improve thermal care by starting with the surrounding, ensure that the adjacent windows are closed. If your room had an air conditioner, please switch it off because the baby needs warmth. Then you remove all wet clothes and replace them with warm, dry clothes. Then you, you put the baby skin to skin and mount every 15 minutes and see whether the temperature is improving. And if the temperature goes back to normal, maintain it. But if it is still persistently below the normal, you prolong day and night skin to skin. So this mother who has abnormal temperature that is persistent will not go home. Next. Baby with a problem. There's another baby who has a problem, like a baby weighing less than 2,000 grams. Those are two kilograms. We are emphasizing such babies should be prolonged skin to skin contact. They need continued support as inpatient. Please do not discharge them home. First, stabilize these babies, show them what to do to do kangaroo, to feed the baby with extra, and to keep these babies warm. Don't discharge them home. They will die in the community. Next. So a baby also with a problem could be a baby with poor feeding. Poor feeding means baby can suck, but can't swallow effectively. Then can swallow effectively, but cannot suck. So such babies will need your attention. The solution to these babies with poor feeding, we shall use alternative feeding methods. So the mother is taught how to express breast milk and use a cup or nosogastric tube for feeding. You shouldn't just discharge them, they have a poor feeding. Ensure that you teach these caretakers how to feed using alternative methods. Let's move to the next slide. So the picture is just summarizing what I've just said above. If a baby has an abnormal temperature or feeding problem, ensure that you improve thermal care. You see, this caretaker is prolonging skin to skin. Then we are also used, trying to show the moms how to express this breast milk, clean containers, express the breast milk, Teach them if they are keeping it just at room temperature, it can last like four to six hours. If they have a refrigerator like in town, they can keep it even over 24 hours or over a month if it is frozen. Show them emphasizing hygiene, dietary, and how often she should feed. Then the last pic is showing how you can feed by cup. Please don't pour, show the mothers how they feed these babies. The baby should just lick this milk and should be able to be supported upright to feed. Very important. Next. Then we have this baby with a danger sign. We used not to differentiate a problem 
and a danger sign, but as I've emphasized the problems are those other ones that I've just said above. But a baby with a danger sign, assess these danger signs, could be baby is not able to feed, has an abnormal temperature, is convulsing, is, ha is having no movement. So when you detect a danger sign, it's a risk of death. Please re reduce the risk by doing your best. Next. So, baby with a danger sign could be fast breathing, could be chest in drawing, grunting, has no movement, baby is not feeding at all, a temperature in that category, has seizures, has severe jaundice that is in the palms and the soles, baby is less than 1.5, please don't discharge this baby home. Don't just tell the mother the baby will improve. This baby immediately should be given a first line antibiotic, and if you can advance care within your facility, do so. If you can't arrange for transport and advance care. Next. So for such babies with a danger sign or those that have a problem, we need to stabilize such sick babies. These are sick babies that we should pay attention to. These are the babies that we are losing. These are the increases in mortality. So what should we do? We should ensure baby is breathing spontaneously. And in case the baby has anything not spontaneous, ensure that you assist. If he's gasping, please ventilate the baby to start breathing. If the baby is breathing and the heart rate is above 100 but has flaring, please ensure that you administer oxygen using appropriate delivery method. And as Dr. Vick emphasized, in case the baby has respiratory distress, please, the continuous positive air pressure that sip up is the way to go. As she said, most of us have tried to make the local sip up, but it will depend on how you've made the delivery of oxygen to this baby and which type of oxygen source are you using. Are you using a concentrator that is even less than five liters that one will not deliver the sip up. Are you using a cylinder? How much are you giving? How are the plums snagging in the nostrils? How are you taking care of this baby? As we advocate for the actual manufactured sip ups. Then we should ensure warmth. Warmth very important. A cold baby, all the systems will shut up. All the systems will shrink and they will shut up. The systems will shut up, meaning the baby will not functionalize. So when we ensure warmth, other things will be able to come up like breathing, feeding, but a cold baby is likely to die because of cold stress. Ensure that the babies are warm. Then care about glucose levels. Ensure that this baby who is sick, you add access an intravenous line and give dextrose 10% as those protocols show. Then protect these babies from infection. This starts from 5S. Ensure that your room, your care corner, your newborn care corner is clean. Ensure that you wash hands. Hand washing has been emphasized from the first presenter. Hand washing prevents up to 80% of infection. Hand rub in between caring for these babies. Mothers should keep clean, ensure they bathe. They come in with clean clothes. You tell them the time, avoid crowds. Most of the neonatal care corners, even relatives are allowed everywhere. We should prevent this. This is all source of infection. Ensure that we prevent infection to these babies. And for such sick babies, as I said, give antibiotics to promote control of infection and must give, that baby must also have a good skin color, the pink, baby should be pink, meaning it's saturating well, it's doing well, the systems are moving on well. Baby has a good muscle tone and always check on the cold status. Is it clean, is it dry? Is there anything on the cold? Are there signs of cold sepsis? Show the mothers how to clean. Ensure the cold is left clean, dry, and the diapers always below the cord. Next. 
And when should we refer these babies? And as I said, all the sick babies should be referred if you can't manage the babies. But as an emphasis, in case you're like in a primal level facility where you will not be able to care like for the prematures and they are the most babies that have these problems. If you anticipate possible preterm labor or birth, just give doses of dexamethasone and refer the mother when she's still pregnant to the facility that can give care for this premature baby. The baby is better cared for where the services are and the mother's womb is the best transfer when the baby is still in the womb. But in case the mother comes in second stage to your facility, first assist her to give birth, ensure you do your HBB very properly, stabilize this baby, and when the baby is stable, transfer in kangaroo mother care to a higher level facility that can give the secondary care. And maybe to take us back about the doses of dexamethasone, give this mother like six milligram, two doses, so that she can be able to move and this baby's lungs will be helped to grasp the mother move zone. It will make a difference in increasing the gaseous exchange of the river of this premature baby's lungs. Then you should also communicate and counsel the mothers, the caretakers. Don't just give them the baby to take to the next level facility. Explain to them why you can't manage this baby at your facility and why it will be better to go to the facility that has services that can better take care of this baby. Counsel them because they are going to another place where they are not used to do. And you know, there are so many social and economical implications attached to transfer from your facility that you had trusted to go for, for care. So ensure you communicate. Communicate also to the place where you're going to transfer this baby so that they are aware, give a call and bring in a baby so that they prepare for this baby better. If possible, you escort these patients to where you're taking the baby so that you give a report and clearly write down what you've done at your facility and transfer the baby to the facility that can take care of this better. Next. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you, Sister Agnes. As a follow on to your presentation, we shall just have a short video on the referral of a sick baby. And then thereafter, we'll take some questions. Um, Richard, can you please play the video? Over. Um, Richard, you need to share the video when you've selected the audio or option. If not, we can't hear. Referring a sick baby To provide the best care for a sick baby, there will be times when you will need to refer them urgently to a higher level facility. This video will show the important features of a referral process. This baby has an umbilical infection and needs urgent referral. First, explain the need for referral to the family. It's important to gain their confidence, especially of the key decision maker, often the husband or mother-in-law. 
carefully describe the urgent condition of the baby and that a higher level of care can probably save the baby's life. Be patient and sensitive in answering their questions. Then, arrange for transport of the mother and baby together, plus the other family member. Notify the facility about the baby's condition and when they should be expected. Be sure to let them know if the mother has just given birth. Communities should develop ways to meet emergency referral needs. This community has established ties with private transport drivers whose vehicles are reliably maintained. They have also organized a small emergency fund with contributions from all villages. Richard, the video has gone off. Uh, sorry about that. We are working to get back. them know if the mother has established ties with private transport drivers whose vehicles are reliably maintained. They have also organized a small emergency fund with contributions from all villages. Prepare the baby for the journey by giving the first doses of antibiotics. Guide the mother to breastfeed or give expressed breast milk by cup or feeding tube before their departure. Positioning the baby skin to skin will keep him warm during the journey. Write a referral note. Include your exam findings, the reason for the referral, and all treatments given. Ask them to give you feedback. Include any other important notes such as maternity and newborn records. Advise the mother to feed the baby and keep him warm and protected during transport. There are many reasons that referral to a higher level facility may not be possible. Some reasons include remoteness, lack of transportation, lack of money, and lack of trust in the higher level facility by the family. In cases when referral is really not an option, do your best with the resources you have, even though the care will not be equivalent. Keep the mother and baby at your clinic. Continue to support the family. The treatment, including antibiotics, should be continued. Make sure the baby is fed every three hours with breast milk and kept warm with skin-to-skin -skin contact. Discharge the baby when the illness has resolved. She's feeding well, gaining weight, the temperature is stable, and the family feels capable of caring for the baby at home. Remember, explain the need for referral carefully to the family. Develop a community referral plan, including transport and funds. Give the first doses and keep the baby fed 
and warm during the journey. Um, thank you very much, Richard, for sharing that video. Um, we will go into the questions. Uh, one key question, uh, which goes to Sister Agnes, there's, there's a question on neonatal infection. Uh, what is the best antibiotic? Someone had mentioned IV ceftriaxone and gentamicin, and for how long will you give it? If, if you could comment on that quickly, thank you. Thank you very much. Minister of Health recommends the first line antibiotic as ampicillin and gentamicin, which is ampicillin is 50 milligram per kilogram body weight, 12 hourly, whether full term or pre term is the best. Then gentamicin, we are still at three milligram per kilogram body weight for the pre terms, then five milligram per kilogram body weight for the full terms. And the gentamicin is given once a day. And when you're giving these antibiotics, please give them each at its own time. Don't mix them in between syringes because you are economizing the syringes. Please reconstitute the medication because these babies will need too small to achieve, to get better. So I'm pissing and gentle at the first line. We don't really use the safe track zone. Safe track zone has contraindications, especially for the neonates. It competes with the the sites for the conjugation of bilirubin. So we might end up, this baby is going into jaundice. Unless culture and sensitivity has shown that this baby needs the safe react zone, it is contraindicated. First line, use ampicillin and gentle. And if you have facilities that can do a therapy, you move on to the right antibiotic, but basically ampicillin and gentle will do you miracles. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Sister Agnes. Uh, the question to Dr. Victoria, is there any role of uh, aminophilin or caffeine in the management of preterms? That's a question that came specific for you. Over. Uh, yeah. And all preterms who are born less than 32 weeks, all those who are born less than 1.5 are prone to apnea or prematurity because of the immature brain. So to prevent that, we basically need to have I mean, uh, uh, drugs which can uh, uh, prevent apnea. And the, 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 the most effective drug is actually caffeine, but it's quite expensive and we, we don't have it in all our units. Aminophilin still works, so it would be always good uh, to give uh, uh, aminophilin or caffeine to babies who are less than 32 weeks or those who are 1.5 kilos and below. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Victoria. Um, Richard, I do not see Dr. Brenda. I don't know if she is okay. with you. Oh, Dr. Munobe, I'm here. I could go right ahead and join. Oh, great. Okay, there you are. Um, so you're welcome, Brenda. Okay. Please go ahead and make your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. I will be sure to fit into five minutes of everyone's time. And once again, um, it is very honorable to be here in the space where we are improving child health in the country. And thank you so much to the previous presenters. And I will go right ahead and talk about what we have today on the plate. So, so much work has gone into, you know, clinical outcomes and research and so many interventions have been done. And we found it pertinent to try to find a way of linking the clinical impact interventions and approaches to research. So this is what we're going to present today. And we hope that we shall be able to sustain this in the subsequent Safe Motherhood webinar series. So amidst the vast improvements in newborn outcomes across the country, a lot needs to be done to accelerate our efforts and see them come to fruition. Among the various strategies, uh, among the various strategies that have uh, occurred across the country, there is need to link evidence-based research 
across various settings similar to Uganda. And what does that mean for us in the research landscape for the country? We anticipate an increase in current knowledge and interventions that improve newborn outcomes as evidenced by current research. And as you had Dr. Victoria presenting the various literature aspects um, across Sub-Saharan Africa, across various uh, regions like China and how they reflect or are closely similar, similar to what we do. So we shall be sharing from today and in the subsequent webinars, uh, various research points that link to the presentations that are being shared here and the summaries will look as the will look like the slide that you see there and this will be shared in email to link each of the webinar topics to the research that is currently ongoing and as you see as of 25th January 2022 we're able to find a current paper that uh, had been published in the space of the work we are presenting today so just sliding back up to the previous uh, slide, um, that relevance of research for this current topic, uh, there needed to be current data on newborn mortality and newborn care practices in Uganda. And as we look through the, this rapid assessment in literature, we found that not so much is there in writing or the research landscape across the country, yet there's so much such as what we share here in the CMEs and the webinars. And we hope that this shall eventually translate into published papers uh, with Uganda informing the research landscape across the region. And the emphasis that Dr. Um, Victoria shared- uh, Brenda, the levels Brenda is, could you increase the size? Please. I don't know. I'm blind. <laughs> um, is this better? Uh, Dr. Kajum, is that better? Yes. yes much better. Awesome. Thank you. So as Dr. Victoria had presented earlier, a lot more work needs to go into understanding um, the paucity in the levels of newborn care and coverage of newborn care practices, such as the availability of special care units and the neonatal intensive care units. And in collaboration with the Makera School of Public Health that has a vast landscape on research and uh, baseline assessments, as well as rapid assessments for newborn care across the country, a lot more of this research will be done to contribute to these uh, monthly presentations. And lastly, about the topic of components of essential newborn care, Again, we do share in the, as we said, this is going to be shared in the PDF that this is just a screenshot showing what has happened across the country and what WHO says in their white paper on uh, the esti estimated contribution of uh, Africa as well as Uganda to the neonatal mortality of the country, as well as the projections by 2030 of our neonatal mortality and what we need to do to reduce those statistics. Uh, during the rapid desk review, we did find that there's a variation in the prevalence of immediate newborn care practices, um, though skin to skin, which has been emphasized uh, most of the time after delivery is predominantly low, and there needs to be um, specific health worker interest in emphasizing the need for skin to skin, as well as uh, emphasizing the benefits of uh, kangaroo mother care across all health uh, care providers. And as presented earlier, the newborn mortality is still high and there's need to strengthen the quality of care, which would provide the acceleration and acceleration in progress for survival and promoting health and well-being of all uh, babies born. And lastly, some of these topics are in the subsequent lineup. So these topics will be, uh, there will be a deep dive for these as the months come. So Dr. Jolie had presented in the beginning the need to accelerate progress for newborn survival on such platforms as well as the health centers. Uh, globally and in sub-Saharan Africa, newborn mortality has reduced, and yes, it has. A lot of work has gone into that. But still, sub-Saharan Africa, where Uganda falls as a region, accounts for 41% of all newborn deaths worldwide, with a neonatal mortality at 27 deaths per 1,000 life births. And as mentioned by all the presenters, our SDG target is 12 deaths per 1,000 life births. It's possible, it's doable, but as we transition to the new technology and evidence-based strategies and use of uh, modern um, special care units as well as uh, neonatal intensive care units to improve uh, childborn outcomes. And as presented earlier, the predominant causes of death among babies continue to be preterm births, intrapartum related complications and infections, both during pregnancy and after delivery. 
So some of what came out of the research, what does the literature say and how can we improve essential newborn care for all babies born to us in the country? Uh, what came to stand across all the papers is the basic preventive newborn care arising from all the different uh, cadres of care, the care before and during pregnancy, clean delivery practices to reduce success, um, temperature maintenance to address hypothermia, I adequate eye and cord care as presented by um, sister prior to my presentation, as well as early and exclusive breastfeeding for all babies. And lastly, continuing essential care for every newborn through all the approaches we described, as well as assessment and classification of all infants, including those in, uh, produced in high risk pregnancy, as well as breastfeeding and nutritional supports in hospitals, and lastly, emphasis on thermal support and referral in case of need for both uh, in need of higher services as evidenced in the video before. Thank you so much. And this will be shared in, by email and the suggested solutions broadly from everything is sharing best, best practices and success stories as we've done today. Strong leadership and sustainability of such platforms for knowledge sharing, as well as midwife led continuity of care in improving perinatal and neonatal outcomes. Thank you so much, and we look forward to providing you with more of this. Over. Um, thank you, Brenda, for that summary. Very enlightening. And it's very important for us to know that there will be a lot of research answering our local problems. I will go over to Sister Atlas. There was a question for you. Q&A. How do you exactly give two doses of DEXA to the mother? And then secondly, with regard to pre-term baby breastfeeding, how do you support the mother to breastfeed the baby that she has more than The actress? Thank you, Christine, for your question. We do see that. And part, part of the clinical cascade for mothers uh, receiving care in hospitals who produce preterm babies and are unable to breastfeed, as Dr. Victoria had provided, most SCUs and NICUs. Um, do have supportive uh, feeding through through the tubes, supportive feeding through expressing breast milk and using the syringes, pretty much fitting into the resources we have, although there could be more robust technologies and supplies to support these mothers because the children are not yet at time and having a strong suckling reflex to enable them breastfeed. So there are different strategies that have been taken up and I guess these are some of the things we can share in the literature moving forward. Um, Maybe Dr. Victoria could supplement on that or Dr. Mnuchin. Um, thank you, Brenda, for the answer. I think most of the aspects were covered. I would like to um, just request, I don't know if Sister Agnes, you're still on. So the question directed towards your presentation about this and it Dr. Dale, okay, we have some hands raised. Maybe we could allow them to ask a few questions. Thank you, Richard. We'll start with Gloria, after Gloria Charles, then after Charles, and then, and then lastly, Miriam. So, Gloria, Please go ahead. Participants, please go ahead and uh, unmute. 
Charles, you are in the room. So actually, I'm unmuted. Please go ahead. Charles, you're on back. Please go ahead. You are unmuted. So that you can understand. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, Richard, please make sure that you're given the rights to unmute. Richard, can you hear me? Have you given them the right to unmute? Yes, I have. They are all the time. Charles. Hope they can hear me. Gloria. Yodi. And any of you, please unmute Nelson. Yes. Thank you. This is Nelson. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm a technician at Lira University, teaching hospital. Uh, I have two questions, and uh, I think they will cut across the presenters. I will not specify. One is going to the nursing and midwifery specialization. Uh, now that he, according to the first presenter, he said in the, in the line of having a, a very good team that is going to make us achieve this goal of 12 uh, neonatal deaths per 1,000 live births, we have seen a very good team on the medical side of doctors up to a neonatologist. But then in, in as far as our country is concerned, the nursing and midwifery team has not been very well developed to that level. And even those who have tried to push or to get this knowledge from outside, we do not have an inclusive structure to uh, bring them on board in order to assist in this. Is there any plan in, in the direction of policy to have this other team also put in place so that they can work alongside the neurologist in order to achieve this goal? And then question number two, uh, in the upcountry neonatal unit, I have seen that uh, much of our attention is given to the, to the neonate who is sick, but this is a, the care is a, a continuum. But we, we give less attention to the mother, especially in terms of the mother's welfare and feeding, because it is the, from the mother that we are going to have the continuity of care and the breast milk and all those other things. Is there any study that has done whereby the NICU extends its attention to the welfare of the mother, as this mother may even spend almost a month on the unit and the, the sleeping is not guaranteed, the feeding is not guaranteed, and any other form of care? Thank you. Um, thank you, Nelson. We have a second question before we get Glory. Okay, please go ahead. Um, Jody. Yeah, I think let's move on. Okay, I was, I, I was just trying to give them an opportunity to ask the question. So the, the question was basically to, to any of the panelists to respond to Nelson's you know, comment and question. Sister Agnes, Victoria, or Joe would be welcome to respond to you. Um, Richard, are you here hearing me? I'm dropping off and on the network. Storm. Yes, sir, your network is a bit short. Yes, we have a little hailstorm where I am. Dr. Victoria, Dr. Julie, are you able to respond to some of Nelson's questions? Dr. 
Professor Victoria, can you hear us? Dr. John Nagunda, can you hear us? Okay, um, so thank you, um, Richard, because I think that the network is poor because of the, the current uh, weather that's going on, because mine is going off and on, I've had to change devices. So um, just in summary, I'll just go over three main aspects. One, uh, Dr. Jolly Nakunda was able to go over the why our newborns are dying and look at some key statistics. And she also reminded us about our target for 12 deaths per 1,000 night births as our SDG. She also highlighted the importance of skilled birth attendants. And currently, it is noted to be about 74%. Dr. Victoria Nachbuka walked us through the different levels of care. And important to note is that each level of care requires a certain amount of skill the essential newborn, the specialized newborn and intensive care. She also highlighted some key cross-cutting issues that you would need, such as pediatric surgery and, and others. She also highlighted the importance of having low technology, cost-effective technology, and having a, a skilled workforce. Sister Agnes walked us through the different aspects of newborn care, giving us the, the ABCs of how to take care of the child. And Dr. Brenda ended by sharing with us some research areas which are quite important for us to improve our care. I'm very honored and happy to say a big thank you to everyone who was able to attend the session and to thank our panelists for running us through and to thank the organizers. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Richard if there are any other announcements before we close. Thank you. Uh, being Dr. Gail Munube, the president of the Uganda Pediatric Association. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Dale Mugobe, for moderating this session and for putting together a team of panelists who have done a very good job of providing this uh, continuous medical education and essential newborn care. We thank you, our panelists, uh, Dr. Victoria Nachaboka, Dr. Jody Nakonda, and Sister Agnes. Thank you also, Dr. Brenda Carono, for the research piece that you have provided. We continue to have these webinars and uh, like to uh, just give you just a brief highlight of what is coming up in the next few uh, months. We are going to have a webinar on announcement and antipartum hemorrhage or pH, and quite interesting topics will be discussed. That's uh, in March, and we'll have one after that on kangaroo care, which will be disseminating uh, kangaroo care KMC guidelines, but also discussing the clinical perspectives on improved survival following kangaroo care. So, and a lot more will be happening throughout the year, from both maternal and neonatal topics. I would like to highlight that um, when you're registering, please register your council registration number as it is on your council license for medical doctors. The Uganda Medical Medical Practitioners Council gets a license, it has a registration number, it has both a letter and numbers. So make sure you register both as it is, do not include any characters so that we can be able to award you your CPD points. We don't have the wrong number, we can't award you your CPD points. For the nurses and midwives, please still use the registration number that is provided by the council in full. If it has the letters and numbers, please provide all the details so that your points can be accredited. It is a system generated accreditation, so if the number is wrong or the ticket is missing, it will not allocate your CPD points. For the allied health professionals, we are still uh, reaching out to your council to accredit this webinar for your CPD points. We have submitted our 
documents of uh, education and we hope that will cause more freedom. So uh, I'd like to also ask that those that are joining on one computer, it must be a hospital, a health center, a health facility joining together as a group. Please always send us a list of everyone who has participated with their details, their name, their email, their phone number, and their council registration number, so that we can also award their CPD points. Uh, we want to thank you. We'll share the recordings and the slides. Uh, watch out for an email from the National Safe Motherhood. That's nasmekug at gmail.com, which we use to share around these uh, recordings. We use the emails that you provide at the registration. We're not able to capture these that you put in the chat, but we use that, those emails that you provide at the registration because it's all system generated. We thank you so much for attending this webinar. We look forward to hosting you again uh, next month. On the 31st, we meet. These webinars happen every last Thursday of the month from 2 to 4 p.m. Please. Uh, Send this message out there when you these flyers and emails to share widely so that uh, this uh, continuous education can go the country. We welcome our colleagues who are joining us from across uh, the world. We know the teams from Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, USA, and other countries. We thank you for joining us and let us know how we can support you by receiving CPD points. The webinars are hosted by the National Safe Motherhood Expert Committee, the Ministry of Health, that, that is chaired by uh, Dr. Charles Solaro, the Director of General Health Services, sorry, the Director of Clinical Services, and there's a team uh, that is working to ensure that uh, we reduce maternal and fetal mortality. So today, I will chat to you as a host as part of our secretariat. I wish you the very best in the evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Richard. Have a good evening. And everyone should drive home safely within the Kampala region. Yes, it's quite a storm. Uh,